you have cards? You want to bring them? I'll collect the cards and then. Uh, we... Okay, good. Can we just speak? Do we have to write them down? Well, not, not really, but the people that did write them down. <laughs> Right in the way you. <laughs> I know. I'm pointing at you. Can we text them instead? <laughs> Can we text them instead? Yeah. No, this old school. This is true. After viewing that clip and having the knowledge that both Democratic and Republican administrations are involved, how can any how can anyone be registered in one of those duties, or more importantly, how can we vote for only their candidates? Yeah. It's a real flaw in the system, isn't it? <laughs> and a real flaw in the people that they serve up yeah. to, to be our candidates. Um, you know, there's got to be a, another way. I'm not an expert on U.S. politics, but there's got to be another way. And. Uh, whether it's influencing the people who might run for president, Bernie Sanders, maybe, somebody like that, or making sure that you get out in the street and put your body into it when one of these uh, people comes. Some of you know that I was beat up pretty bad by simply turning my back on Hillary Clinton. Did not know that? I have a little clip to show you on that if you want to see it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, I wish I had an answer to that, but I really don't. You know, all, I, all I would suggest is that you not be discouraged, because discouraged is not allowed. Disgusted? Yeah, that's allowed, okay? Discourage not. Discourage is not an action verb. We need action right now. Uh, next question. Is an inadequate newspaper like the Sacramento Bee better than no <laughs> newspaper? <laughs> well, a, did you hear that question? It's a very complimentary question to the Sacramento Bee. Okay. Uh, you know, my, my own opinion is that, uh, well, it's hard to answer. It depends on the person. If the person knows his or her way around the internet, then yeah, it's a rudimentary thing. Click on, oh, my, my son in LA who created a, a website for me. I'd be really angry if you thought that I forgot to mention it. RayMcGovern.com, where I write most of my interviews, my speeches are on RayMcGovern.com, but you can go to any number of really good websites. My favorite is ConsortiumNews.com, and I write for that. Uh, but Bob Perry, one of the few investigative journalists left in this country, runs that, and he's the best. Or none. He's on the, on the par with Cy Hirsch. He's really the best. So uh, those people should be able to do that and not read the Sacramento Bee. But for others, you know, have five kids, two jobs, and you know, don't have time to to tune in. Well, Sacramento Bee might be better than nothing at all. But somebody's got to tell them you know, to read it with a this die. Now, not having not having read the Sacramento Bee for a while, uh, I feel like. I'm speak freely about it because I don't know what I'm talking about in this case. Right. Next one. On March 25th, 2014, at a Washington press conference, you said, Obama is afraid. You know what they did to MLK. Do you think Obama is afraid someone will kill him? Yeah, that's a good question. Now, I never thought that after serving in the CIA for 27 years, I would hear myself saying this, but I do believe that President Barack Obama is afraid of the CIA. I think he's afraid of the NSA. I think that, I think that explains why James Clapper, having lied under oath on the 12th of March last year, is still the director of national intelligence. Can you believe it? Mm -hmm. I think that explains why John Brennan, who hacked into the Senate computers that were investigating the CIA for torture, in which Brennan was involved, he's still head of the CIA. So, how do you figure that? And I think what I meant, may have mentioned that day is that I have a good friend who's an entirely reliable reporter. Uh, this is secondhand because he heard this from a friend of his. This friend of his was a very well-heeled person who was uh, with a progressive group of donors, uh, contributors to Obama's second presidency. 
and they were quizzing him over a kind of a small dinner of 12 people, and one, they were saying, you know, you're supposed to be a progressive, why did you do this? You know, why didn't you do that? And finally he got up over dessert and he said, look, don't you remember what happened to Dr. King? Now, if I hadn't witnessed Obama for the last six years, I would find that too much of a stretch. But something's got to explain. I mean, all right, say so he's, so he's a wuss, okay? And I've checked with the doctors at uh, Hello? Yeah, they might have pushed the button to try out. Uh, uh, maybe the battery's gone. It's possible. I've checked that the, with the doctors at George Washington University Hospital in Washington, and they're five years away from a, a bank called an implant. <laughs> <laughs> so that's not an option. Now, you know, there may be another explanation. Maybe, maybe lawyers like him see so many sides of various things that they tend to bend with the, with the wind. But, uh, you know, when you see, well, we have no war. Then we have no war started today. today. No war against Syria. Last year, he stood up to these guys and said, no, we're not going to have a war this year. Oh, you do a war, you know? We'll do a war for what? I mean, we've been there, done that. We ruined, we destroyed Iraq. And, you know, so I, I just, you know, what he needs to do is kind of rejigger his old mental apparatus. And uh, I think, I think one of the real dangers is he is afraid you know, you talk about blackmail. People don't like to use the word blackmail. But if NSA has the goods on, on Obama from way back, and uh, and the FBI does too, it's the same as J. Edgar Hoover. And that was precisely why they writ wrote that Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, so nobody could do that, NSA or N FBI. So, you know, people are afraid, and when they're afraid, you know, I'll just give you, yeah, good. I'll give you one example. I, Coley Marley, the wonderful whistleblower from the FBI in Minneapolis who laid out chapter and verse of what happened before 9-11 and what didn't happen with the FBI structure. Uh, uh, what was I going to say here? Uh, what was I just talking about? Coley? Coley Marley. Yeah, but I mean, but, Blackmail. 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 Yeah, yes. I asked Colleen, <laughs> forgive me, I've been on the lecture circuit for 10 days now. Um, uh, she, I said to Colleen, look, um, you, you were in the FBI during these years, or shortly thereafter. Bobby Kennedy, who I admire so much still, you know, a civil rights advocate. He signs the permission for J. Edgar Hoover to wiretap Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. and you know suggest that he commit suicide or else they're gonna release the stuff on these power motors that, that Dr. King had and all that stuff. How do you explain Bobby Kennedy giving J. Edgar Hoover that permission? And she says, Ray. J. Edgar Hoover had all the goods on the Kennedy brothers. You know, the nice little girls that they had that come into the White House pool and all that kind of stuff. They were afraid. There's a lot of fear. And so it's not such a leap to say Obama is afraid. Uh, and that's really bad news. But, you know, to the degree we're aware of that, we can hold people's feet to the fire. Diane Feinstein, you know, what about her? She's your, uh, she's your yeah. first thought about her is uh, my father was a lawyer, right? And he used to say, there is such a thing as uh, statutory senility. <laughs> <laughs> and in his day it came at 60 years old, right? But I think we can maybe 70, 70 now, and Feinstein is seven or eight years past 70. Now, either it's statutory senility or it's fear. How did her husband make all that money? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who knows Who knows about that? NSA, FBI, you know? And so when, when the NSA guys come to the oversight committees, which has become the overlook committee, <laughs> they make her complicit. She appeared, she approved a lot of that stuff. 
she said as recently as several months ago, uh, this eavesdropping is necessary, and this blanket surveillance is necessary, and I'll never, uh, never uh, vote against it or something like that. Well, now she is holding up a five-year study on torture by the CIA, right? Okay. So, what's that all about? Well, John Brennan is the head of the CIA, and he was involved in all that stuff. John Brennan used to be uh, number one on her dance card. Okay. Uh, they had a wonderful pas de deux going there. Uh, uh, you know, she being complicit in what John Brennan wanted to do, and now all of a sudden. Our young staffers, to their credit, have done this wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, have done this investigation of CIA torture, naming names and what happened when, and where, where, does, this, where does this sit? Anybody know? Brennan's cat. Well, uh, Brennan has it, but he's redacted it and given it to Obama, and Obama has it, and he's given it to Dianne Feinstein, and she says, oh, it's been redacted too much. She gives it back to Obama, and Obama gives it back to John Brennan. And what does John Brennan do? He calls George Tenet and General Hayden, the yeah. previous head of CIA, and asks them to help him redact it. So, what Diane Feinstein will tell you is that, what can I do? Uh, I can't release it uh, uh, without the redactions, and now the redactions make it nonsensical. Guess what? She can release it. She can release it. The law empowers her to go to the full Senate and release it. Now she uses her own judgment as to which redactions to accept and which not, but that law comes from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act at the same time when the lawyers and the church committee, and I know one of them, he said, look, you know, there's gonna come a time when Congress wants to release information for the public good and the administration is going to say, no dice, it's classified, national security, or whatever, okay? And we have to make sure that the Congress can exercise its co-equal powers, and so with the, with the approval of the full Senate, it can be released, despite objections from the President and from the likes of John Brennan. Now, does anybody know that? No. Is that in the Sacramento Bee? No, no. But it's true. Now, people say, well, yeah, but they never used that. They did during the Panama Canal negotiations when Jimmy Carter was you know, doing this treaty about the Panama Canal, the Republicans were up in high dudgeon and they said, we need to see the documents about these negotiations. And Jimmy Carter said, no, no, you can't see that, the classified owns it. And they voted in the Senate to release those documents. The documents were released, so there's precedent for precisely what needs to happen now. So, you know, again, you have to know these things uh, you have to kind of seek them out, but I'd be writing, I, I wouldn't leave Dianne Feinstein's office saying, look, you know you have the, you know to have the power to release that document. Don't play games with us. Don't do this little charade about giving it to the president and then give them, oh, you, you know, <laughs> give me a break. The guy's a torturer, John Brennan, and he's head of the CIA. And he bragged about what they call extraordinary rendition, which means kidnapping. And he was the deputy executive director when all this was happening. And guess what? He was on the routing for all these cables, all these emails. Okay, what does that mean? Well, there's one sacred principle in intelligence work, and that is the need to know. Now, if you're talking about torture and all these kinds of things, you're going to keep that a close hold, right? Okay, so if Brennan's on that routing, he has a need to know, okay? And that means he's involved, ipso facto involved. So. You know, pardon me if I get a little Irish here and a little get angry, but you know, Diane Feinstein sets me up off the wall. I've, go ahead, please. The next one. There was actually a question about Diane Feinstein. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I understand she bakes good chocolate cakes. <laughs> My grandmother told me I always find something good to say about. <laughs> there was someone who brought me a question, and I said you could raise your hand and ask it. The two of you in the back, go ahead. We're kind of short on time, so. Okay. Um, Dr. I believe it does, yeah. And did you, everybody hear that question? No. Stay, no. The militarization of the police 
you know, his APCs and these tanks and, you know, the whole business, uh, yeah. do they constitute, uh, what was the word you used? Standing armies. Standing armies. Yeah, this is precisely the kind of thing that James Madison, to his great credit, the co-writer of the Constitution, feared. He said, once you had standing armies, forget about it, you know? Your democracy is in peril uh, because they'll be used. And, you know, he, he railed against what he called the accretion of too much power in the hands of the executive, the president, okay? And he said, this is the definition of tyranny. And when you look at what's happened here with not only Bush, but Obama, the executive, let's take torture, take eavesdropping. The Congress is supposed to be one of the balancing organs, right? We all learned that in junior high school. Division of power and all that. Congress is complicit. Mm -hmm. uh, they're fearful, like everybody else, not only are black, blackmail, but they're fear of being told tra traitors. You know, fear, fear, fear. 9/11, 9/11, terrorism, terror. How can you vote against a bill that gives more and more money to the intelligence community to fight against terrorism? That money has doubled. And now, now when you get all this stuff uh, to you, yeah, I don't know if. Uh, uh, where are we again? In Sacramento, ha have, uh, do you have any tanks here? Yeah. Well, yeah. tanks, but no yeah. tanks. If you got, you got no tanks. <laughs> <laughs> thankful for small favors. But, you know, there's one, one group that profits from all this, the, the old expression, cui bono. Who is it that profits from all this? And I used to think it was sort of like a, a trite explanation of military-industrial complex, you know, but it's just a little too pat. Well, you know what? <laughs> Not only that, but Eisenhower wanted to say military industrial congressional complex. <laughs> and they said, well, that would be going a little too far. So he just said military industrial. But you know what? It's the same. You get Congress appropriating the funds to the arms makers and the arms dealers and sellers and all, and then uh, they sell and make a lot of money, and they siphon off just a little bit of that money to the Congress people and the senators, and they get reelected, and then they appropriate more money for the blah blah blah. blah. It's a, it, uh, is this a great country or what? Okay. <laughs> so that's the way it happens, and it's worse now because you not only have the military, industrial, congressional complex, you have the media, fully complicit, and you have the security services which have doubled in size since 9-11, doubled, okay? So, you know, when you have all those things enmeshed here, you have very close to what Mussolini described as fascism. Do not blanch before the word. I'm told, great, don't say fascism. For God's sake, everyone will immediately think concentration camps. Well, that's their problem, not mine. Fascism is, you know, a separate and distinct phenomenon. It can involve concentration camps. But fascism is what Mussolini said. The corporate and the government and the media and the security people are all enmeshed together. And that's what we face. And if we don't get out in the streets, if we're not prepared to put our bodies into it, I think it may be too late. Yeah. And that's why I think Cesar Chavez had it right. Uh, we've got to figure out ways to do it. Now, people say, well, how, what can I do? My suggestion is something I learned later in life. You find a small group of really simpatico folks, right? Five or six, seven at the tops. You know? Just make sure there's one woman in each group, at least one woman, because they have all the guts. In the, you know, when I look at uh, Sidney Sheehan, when I look at at uh, Medea Benjamin or Orion Wright, God, you know? Those of you who have seen my little debate with Rumsfeld, I'm sitting there, okay, and I know I have the goods on the guy, and I'm right next to the microphone, and I'm saying, should I, should I get up there? And uh, it was a very hostile crowd, probably you know. I said, I don't know. And then I said to myself, you know, Medea Benjamin wouldn't be having this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of a wuss are you? <laughs> so I got the, the, the thing. So, all I'm saying is that you get a small group of sympathetic people. Do make sure there's at least one woman in it, and there should be a majority of women, in my view. And meet every week. Meet every week. Give priority to meeting every week, and you will be amazed at what the synergy 
of your getting to know each other real well. It's not going to happen the first week or so, but after a couple of months, uh, ideas will crystallize and emerge for you that no one would have been able to think of by themselves. And then you have two things. If I say, for example, I'm going to see Senator Feinstein next Wednesday, then you just know that next week your friends are going to say, Ray, how did that, how'd you do it, Senator Feinstein? <laughs> so there's accountability there and there's incredible support because you really get close to people when you meet with them every week. Now that sounds like a sort of a, you know, a trite sort of thing, but I've seen it work. And you wouldn't believe the things that come out of it. You know, you might not change the world immediately, but you, you can change your immediate circle. You can talk to the sheriff here. You can figure out how to get the sheriff to, you know, turn down the tanks or whatever, you know. So that's, you know, that's sort of what Margaret Mead said, that, you know, the only thing that really changed things is a small group of committed people. Mm -hmm. It's true. I've seen it work. I recommend it very, very uh, sincerely to you. And then we have one last question. We have about three or four minutes. Uh, okay, I'll try to be quick. It's a very good segue to what I wanted to ask. The, uh, a small group of community people can do, can do some great things, but ultimately they need the majority of the people to support them or else it's not going to get done. And, and you talk about the internet being a, a really good replacement for the, for the uh, fourth estate that, that doesn't, it's not helpful. But uh, you know, I spend probably more time than I should on the internet, and I read all sorts of good things, and I'm quite well informed. I read your stuff and lots of other stuff, and I know all the right answers. But I choose what to read. I read mostly the, thing, the things that I agree with, people that support my ideas, which are, of course, the right ideas. But you know, other people think that, too. And so you have you know, the, the, the racists and the neo-Nazis have their own little echo chambers on the internet, and they just they only read that stuff. And then there's probably most of the people who look at the, the, the silly kittens and, and sports and pornography and they don't see any of the political stuff. So we have a very segmented population. We, we don't all watch the 6 o'clock news of Walter Cronkite anymore, old enough to remember that, which as bad as it was, at least there was a common basis for conversation. Right? So we have our echo chamber. How do, we, how do we get to these other people and get them to start looking at some of the information that's out there it's very, it's <coughs> frankly easy to avoid if you don't want to see it. Oh, sure. Denial is a, yeah. more than just the name of the river in Egypt, right? Yeah. yeah, it's very common. Well, what I'm saying is if you get together with people who are great and committed like you, you can figure that out. Well, maybe you won't, you know, maybe you figure it out for a way. long time. Yeah. But let me, let me just say, you mentioned how to be effective, okay? Yeah. Yeah. It's not about being effective. Mm -hmm. I, I found that this is a common American Okay, and so we're reluctant to embark on any really important uh, effort w without some reasonable assurance we're going to be successful, right? right? Nobody likes to be laughed at. Nobody likes, you know. Well, well you know, Dan Berrigan, a uh, Jesuit priest who was the big protester uh, against Vietnam, after they did their first big action where they collected some draft cards. The homemade napalm ignited the draft cards. The police came to Catonsville, Maryland, put them in the only federal building there, the, the post office, okay? Mm -hmm. So they're sitting around, and Dan writes in his autobiography, you know, I began to think, you know, people are going to call me crazy, people are going to call me a, a traitor, people are going to call me all kinds of things, they're going to say, you're just stupid, Dan. And I began to think whether this was worth doing. And I had to think about it, and it was quiet there, and I came to the realization that, as trite as it sounds, the good is worth doing because it's good. The results are not unimportant, but they are secondary. Okay? Who knows what seeds we might be sowing for the future, and who knows when success might come. Good is worth doing because it's good, and there was a great relief in the realization that we had just done something good, right, and boy, did they do something good. Right. Now, the corollary of that is also characteristic of Dan Berrigan, because he's Irish, he had a terrific sense of humor, okay? And he also was a poet. So, in the next paragraph, he says, just then, and there are about 10 of them congregated in a circle there at the post office in Catonsville, including his brother Phil, also a priest, he said, just then, a, a Jut-jawed paradigm of an FBI inspector swung open the door. And he took a look at us and he saw my brother Phil and he said, You again! I'm going to change my religion! 
<laughs> and Dan said, no higher compliment could ever come. <laughs> so, you know, this is, you know, what I'm saying is you do have to keep your sense of humor, but you can't be fixated on results, folks. That's the story it's about. It's about being faithful to the Constitution and to one another in, in these small groups or larger groups and getting out there and, uh, and hitting the pavement and putting your bodies in work. You got one more? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, given the first document you showed uh, yeah. after World War II, and the United States needed to protect it as well from its interest, and then given how you described uh, the fraud of the 2003 invasion of Iraq, can we hear your thoughts of the now bombing of Iraq and now Syria? Yeah. Well, if uh, your policy uh, is 95% hammer, you know, that's all you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Okay? <laughs> Now, what's Obama beholden to? Well, most people will say, we've got to use our armed forces, we got to use, for what? We tried that, you know? If, if the objective is to reduce the threat of terrorism, the worst thing you do is create more terrorists, right? And what I've been using is an analogy that may surprise you, but the way you defeat terrorism is the same way that you defeat malaria. Right? Yeah? Well, with malaria, of course, you find the mosquitoes, right? And you trace them back to where they breed, the swamp where they breed, right? And then, of course, you take three platoons of Marines, sharpshooters, and you try to get all the mosquitoes as they leave the swamp, right? Wrong. What do you do? You drain the swamp. Now, what's the swamp? These terrorists are not, as John Brennan has suggested, hardwired at birth, you know? <laughs> <laughs> they come out of the womb and they just, hey, he's working, hey, he's working. <laughs> That's not it, okay? They have legitimate grievances. Look at the dictators that we've supported just because they have oil or because they have bases that we want to use for enduring military bases, you know? Look at all the, look at how there's no daylight between Israel and the United States, there is no possibility of Israel killing 3,000 Gazans without our full support, without our weaponry, without our $3 billion a year, okay? Look at all that. Why did Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, what did he say was the reason that he, that he was the mastermind behind the 9-11 attacks? Anybody know? Okay, it's written down on page 147 of the 9-11 Commission report, which in itself is a cover-up, but there are little nuggets in here and there, okay? Now, if you look at that page, you realize that the folks that are writing the final report, these young staffers, okay, they read in the Washington Post one day, whoa, they've got Hani Sheikh Mohammed. I got an idea. Since we're supposed to be writing about why they did it, let's ask them why he did it, okay? <laughs> so they go to the CIA and say, ask Hani Ask Khalid Sheikh Mohammed why he did it. Now, they knew that he had studied engineering at the University of North Carolina, Greens, uh, Greensboro. Okay? He said he's, a, he's got a, what's the word, a mechanical engineering degree from something. So these young folks said, well, maybe he had an affair of the heart, you know, it did turn out well. Or maybe somebody called, a lot of people call him a towel head or something like that, but he had a really good. Well, that's how the, the paragraph starts. But what it says is, quote, by his own admission, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's animus toward the United States was not due to any of his experiences as a student in North Carolina, but rather due to his intense hatred of U.S. policy favoring Israel, period, end quote. The mastermind. Now, do I think that's the only reason? No. But why would Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and use that as one of the reasons if it weren't, if it weren't uh, one of the main reasons. And of course, his nephew, who had uh, been involved in the 1993 attempt to down the, the towers, when he uh, went off to prison, he said this is why he did it too. So it's not a negative factor, okay? It's one that cannot speak its name in the media, but let's realize it. Our close identification with Israel is one reason why we're in deep trouble in the Middle East, and there's no good reason for it. 
It's not in Israel's interest over the middle or, or, or long term. A little vignette, uh, David Petraeus with the ten, ten rows of merit badges, <laughs> battle ribbons and stuff, you know. When he came to testify in Congress, when he was still head of the troops out there in, um, in Afghanistan, um, his, uh, his uh, little staff had composed a little briefing. And in that briefing they said, the inability of the United States to resolve the uh, Israeli-Palestinian uh, Israeli conflict uh, endangers U.S. troops and makes it impossible for us to, you know, prevail. Okay. Wow. Well, that got out into the media. And when Petraeus testified before Congress, he forgot that part. So he didn't <laughs> say it. But it was in the rec written record. So what happens? A friend of mine from L.A. Uh, writes an email to Petraeus and says, way to go. I never thought that anyone actually say that the conflict between Israel and Palestine and our role in supporting Israel was a matter of threat to our, our servicemen over there. Way to go. Now Petraeus wrote back. This was a big mistake. Because Petraeus wasn't real good with email. And when he wrote back, the whole thread, his previous emails, was given to my friend. And what did that thread show? That thread, that thread showed that Petraeus immediately emailed Max Boot. Do you know who Max Boot? He's a big, big neoconservative. He used to be the op-ed director of the, Washington, of the Wall Street Journal. He's uh, one of the biggest neoconservatives. And what Petraeus says is, Max, uh, people are saying that I said this, but I didn't say it. It was just crept into my testimony. Uh, what, what should I do? Um, I, had, uh, I had dinner with Ellie Wiesel last week, uh, should I mention that? Or, or I'm going to have a go to the Holocaust Museum next week. What do I do, Max? <laughs> Max, his reply says, don't worry about it, Dave, we got it covered. I just did an op-ed, the title of which is, David Petraeus is not anti-Semitic, so you're covered, don't worry about it. <coughs> and Petraeus is like, are you sure? Are you, are you sure? Are you now, all of this, all of this, gets out from our friend Jim Morris release now that you haven't heard about that, right? But there it is. That's how he had ambitions at the time. No one knew about his uh, dalliances with Paula Broadwell. Uh, so, you know, this is how, how fixated people have to be if they have political ambitions and they don't want any, any hint that they might be anti-Semitic just by saying what the situation is and the situation is that our, the fact that there's no daylight between us and Israel, the fact that we don't do anything to prevent them from building still more settlements on Palestinian land, that, you know, if you want to create more terrorists, man, you can't figure out a better way to do it. And Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, that's what he's talking about. Yes? One thing we have never done is explain to people that Zionism and Judaism are not synonymous. Very different, yeah. Completely different. Yeah. And that's important. Did you hear that? Yeah. Okay. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more, you know. And there are many, many Jew, Jewish Voice for Peace. I'm a member of that. There are really good uh, Jewish people in this country that are trying to, trying to fix it. And, you know, that really needs to happen. Uh, I've, I've kept you beyond uh, class time, and I really appreciate your attention. Um, one second. It's it's really refreshing to see so many people engaged in um, you know defending our civil liberties. And so please share this with the youth in your life. Obviously, there aren't many youth here, but they really need to know about these issues and care about them. So thank you all for coming. Thanks again to um, Ray McGovern for sharing his evening with us.